that's Prince Harry. Uh, I can just about understand that. He certainly got the cotton stop. He knows what he wants to do. Um, and I think in a few generations, the royal society, the royal family, will be talking a language which is uh, completely in in incomprehensible to anybody in this room. So you can see dissent with modification in language happening in front of you. Okay, it happens. It's evolution. It's a fact. It's it's on the it's it's, it's been recorded by the BBC. If you assume, <laughs> so it must be true. If you make some assumptions about the rate of change, and you can do that when you've got speech patterns over different times, you can actually put dates on the time when particular languages actually um, separated. And this is a bit over-detailed, over but it simply shows a tree of some of the European languages and their supposed split, state, split dates. For example, um, uh, English and uh, Swedish probably split about 2,000 years ago. Um, English and French, something like 6,000 years ago. I, uh, Welsh and Irish uh, were separated long before that, and, so, and the Russian family um, long before that again. So you can make some quite sophisticated evolutionary statements about language. But of course, my, as we heard, my first book, uh, still available, all good booksellers, was called The Language of the Genes, and genetics is a language of its own. It's got a, it's got a vocabulary, the, de the genes themselves, uh, and most important, it's got a grammar. And the grammar of genetics is evolution. The grammar of biology is evolution. It's the structure upon which one can attach the entire vocabulary, the entire literature of the science. You can't learn to speak any language properly without understanding the grammar, and you can't be a biologist without understanding evolution. So let's look at this linguistic argument um, and from the point of view of um, evolution. We can take... Most of the languages we see here are still alive. We can go much further back into the past um, with some rather daring assumptions. Uh, this is a, this is a merit rulings tree, which some people would disagree with. But you can see, for example, Chinese, which is C there, might have separated off from the Indo-European languages as much as 25,000 years ago. And there may have been a very early language as early as 60,000 years ago. Well, maybe. There's lots of guesswork in there. But let's now turn to the actual genes. Um, Darwin's machine is descent with modification. As far as we know, language is only descent with modification. There doesn't seem to be any equivalent of natural selection in language. It doesn't seem to be that one language with its structure is intrinsically more successful than others. Well, at the moment, certainly, English is doing rather well. But Darwin had an essential uh, insight to biology because he realized that in his copying process, what was being copied was itself a copying machine. So that anything which was modified and became better at copying itself would spread. So that was natural selection. Inherited differences in the ability to reproduce. That's what selection is. Many people think it's obscure and strange, but in fact it's not. It's very easy. I experienced it very early in my somewhat undistinguished scientific career. In fact, before my scientific career began. Because when I left school for reasons which seemed like a good idea at the time, and probably weren't, I spent almost a year working in a power station. I'm um, working at a power station of a soap factory. And this uh, Unilever, who were the uh, owners of the factory, made detergents. And the way you make detergents is rather interesting. You take a great vat of liquid, and you put this boiling hot liquid, various chemicals in it, um, and you force it through a narrow nozzle. It shoots out of the nozzle um, and makes a fine spray, which then turns into a powder and falls into a vat, and you throw some color into it and sell it at ten times the price. And in my day, the nozzles looked like that. And they were reasonably efficient, but only reasonably so. Now, the physics of what's happening there is extraordinarily difficult, of how uh, a liquid turns into a vapor and a solid simultaneously, how it flows, how it has a phase change. Really, it's very, very hard. Now, Unilever is a rich company. It spends lots of money on research. It hired lots and lots of mathematicians to try and analyze this and improve these nozzles without very much success. They were designers. They were intelligent designers, but they didn't do very well. So some um, rather perhaps less intelligent biology graduates suggested to them that they actually do some Darwinism. What they did was to take this nozzle, make ten copies of it, simple as it was, and change each of those ten absolutely at random. Then test those ten. Maybe one of them did a little bit better. Make ten copies of that, change it at random, and go through that process of natural selection, descent with modification again and again, and after about 50 generations you end up with this. And what this is, 20 generations, this is the nozzle they came up with, which is really quite astonishing. 
It's totally unexpected. Nobody knows the physics of why it works, but it's far, far more efficient than what went before. And the comparison is quite, is quite noticeable. That is what natural selection can do. It is a factory for making almost impossible things. And the, the, that's what, the almost is the crucial word. Who would have ever evo designed a tree kangaroo, that ridiculous animal, climbs trees and falls out of them? Natural selection does what it needs to do and no more. So natural selection is simple. Can we see it happening around us? Well, Darwin himself thought we never would. He thought that evolution was intrinsically a historical science, where you looked into the past and you tried to infer what was going on. Well, now, of course, we know that it's not. We can see selection happening. Indeed, we can see the origin of species happening all around us. And in many ways, as biologists, we're very fortunate to be living through a great experiment in Darwin's machine. And by that, um, I'm talking about the AIDS epidemic. We all know about AIDS and HIV. Um, it, first became, it first came to Western notice in 1981. Um, I was actually in California at the time, and uh, there was a tremendous hysteria about what was going on. I remember one of the theories when these unfortunate male homosexuals, first of all, began to die in large numbers, was that the virus had been put in Tutankhamun's tomb by his priests in order to infect anybody daring enough to break into it. And the Tutankhamun exhibition was in San Francisco at the time, so case, uh, case made. Well, that isn't actually true. Um, it's a classic example of dissent with modification, and we can read the language of the virus with great efficiency, and we see the Darwinian machine hard at work. The story of HIV we know only too well. Um, it's a virus based not on DNA, but on RNA. Um, it gets into human cells and basically hijacks their machinery, forces them to copy the virus, and in the end overwhelms the immune system and kills the patient. I think we know in general um, the, uh, the facts of that. The figures are really quite alarming. These are the figures for uh, people infected in just a few months ago, something like 40 million people in the world, and a gradual increase, uh, and no sign at all of it slowing down in the world as a whole. In some places, the data are particularly depressing. These are age pyramids for Botswana itself. And uh, what we have is the uh, groups of men and women of different age, 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, and so on. And clearly, obviously, older pe people are less common than young people. And in the third world, the developing world, one has a large excess of younger people. The, um, the, the uh, pale blue bars are what would have happened without HIV. The dark blue bars are what is happening because of HIV. And the effects are dramatic in the, eight, the early 80s, when I was in Botswana, late 70s, the life expectancy of a baby born in the hospital in Gaborone was 73, which for sub-Saharan sub Africa was dramatic. Last year, it was 27, entirely because of HIV. And for me, it's a very uh, chastening thought that most of the students I taught, um, who would now be in their 40s and 50s, most of them will now be dead of this illness. So it's a real problem. There's no question. However, it's also a real opportunity because we can see evolution happening. The first European case of HIV uh, recognized was in Sweden. And it happened, it was first recognized almost immediately after the American cases in 1980. And it had to do with a Swedish man who'd been on the island of Haiti. And there he'd picked up the uh, virus, we don't know how, probably by sex, um, picked up the virus and brought it back to Sweden. Um, he was married, um, infected his wife, um, and... and uh,